I'd like to first start out this video by saying how inconsistent many Christians actually are, and I want nothing to do with Christians that are hypocritical. Now, part of these inconsistencies is the fact that Christians don't understand what Yahuwah's sacrifice really was. I am here to set the record straight. Let me make this very clear. It was not necessary for Elohim to die on the cross for us to be saved. The sacrifice had nothing inherently to do with the cross or any form of public execution. Do you want to know what the true nature of Yahuwah's sacrifice was? Yahuwah's sacrifice had nothing to do with literal human sacrifices. The sacrifice of Yahuwah was that he had to humble himself and become a human. He had to subject himself to living in everyday life and submit himself to people. He had to suffer temptation. He had to live morally righteous under any and every wicked thing someone might do to him. All Messiah had to, had to do was live righteously. That was the manner of the sacrifice, in that he had to be willing to suffer. There was a huge difference between being willing to suffer and having a death wish. Most Christians, most Christians make Yahushua out to be someone with a death wish, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Messiah didn't want to die. He wanted to live, and if he had lived, he could have still atoned for us simply by completing the rest of his days, and then dying a natural, normal death. This would have been sufficient atonement for our sins. But this entire time, he had to be fully human, and this means he had to temporarily abstain from certain divine powers at his disposal. He had to limit himself to a physical body, and he could do nothing that was contrary to what an actual man would be able to do. By becoming fully man, he atoned for us by being willing to die for us, but not necessarily having to die. I'd like to point out right away that your argument about religion in your video is extremely flawed. Your understanding of religion is probably based on the extremely flawed view of many religious people in that they believe religion must be accepted on blind faith. Essentially, you are claiming that finding the right religion is purely random probabilities. This couldn't be further from the truth. Not every belief system has the same weight of probability of being right. Why? Because of varying, varying levels of evidence. Thus, the religions that have more evidence would be more probably the true religion. Let's just say that there were 49 coins. Let each coin represent a piece of evidence. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that each coin is equal. Each coin is one dime. This would mean that each individual piece of evidence, at least in this example, will carry the same weight of force in an argument. So with that assumption, let us now simplify it with just taking atheism and Christianity. Let's just limit it to those two options for now. Let's say that a neutral person only has those two choices to pick from for the sake of argument. Now, here's where I'll show you how your view of religion is flawed. Let's further say, for the sake of argument, that Christianity has 35 coins of the 49, whereas atheism has only 14 of those coins. Remember, each coin represents a piece of evidence, so which would be more probably the correct option? Well, let's do some simple math. For atheism, it would be 14 coins out of 49 coins. For Christianity, it would be 35 coins out of 49 coins. Thus, when you do the math, according to this purely hypothetical example, the percent chance of Christianity being right rather than atheism would be 71.4% instead of 50%. This changes things when you actually take evidence into the survey of potential beliefs. Thus, not every option is equal in percentage value, though, in the video you make this claim by presenting each one as an equally viable belief system. 
The past school's wager is a very sad attempt at defending religion. If someone is in doubt over their belief system, they could reassure themselves by using Pascal's wager to demonstrate that if atheism is true, then nothing really matters in the long run anyways. But Pascal's wager does not do anything for a person's salvation. It is merely a tool of rejecting the, de the depressing conclusions atheism would lead to. But this argument, again, really bears no weight in any logical or rational debate or discussion. Now back to your assessment of many, many religions. You divide many denominations of Christianity into thousands of religions, but you are in error. According to the testimony of those denominations, while they disagree with others on many important things, they believe most of the other denominations will be saved. So for example, if you are a Protestant, no matter what kind of Protestant you are, as long as you believe in, in the few essential things, you are not going to hell, according to the Protestants. Thus, even though there might be thousands and thousands of denominations within Protestantism, more than 50% of those denominations believe each other's denominations to be saved. Your number of how many religions there are goes down significantly when you take these things into account. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not a Protestant. I am simply defending religion in general by demonstrating the falsehoods in your percentages argument. Further, not all Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, and Orthodox Jews are going to hell. Some of all those groups can be saved even if they have some things wrong in their beliefs. This also reduces the odds of going to hell significantly, at least based on the mere choice of what belief system you will subscribe to. Again, you do not have to be necessarily 100% correct in your beliefs to be saved. I'd like to ask you why you don't believe in unicorns. I do believe they exist. Why do I? Because it's simply a horse with a horn. What is so hard to believe about that? I don't believe in any magical unicorns, but unicorns, sure, why not? Especially when the Bible teaches this, as well as many other religions. There's nothing ridiculous about a unicorn existing. I also believe in dragons. The evidence of dragons is overwhelming. This is even acknowledged by atheists and agnostics. What is so ridiculous about dragons existing? They are just as amazing and majestic as dinosaurs, but dinosaurs certainly existed and continue to exist. Further, dragons are still being reported by people to this very day. Historically, dragons were seen and killed by people. The att attestation to the existence of dragons is manifest in a wide variety of cultures that are separate, separated by great distances. What is so absurd about dragons? As I covered in the previous video, Messiah did not have to kill himself to atone for our sins. Also, Mary was not impregnated. Do you want to know how Yahushua was born of a virgin? It's called Parthenogenesis, and it is a scientifically verifiable thing. While current Parthenogenesis in females would only create females, just the fact that Parthenogenesis is naturally occurring demonstrates that the whole idea of a virgin birth is not absurd. People who die do not go to heaven or hell yet, but that is another issue. Alright, that's that was just a couple, that was the main things in this video that I wanted to uh, clarify of what, you're, what you were wrong about. You are wrong. Yahuwah did not create Adam and Eve without morality. You misunderstand what the knowledge of good and evil actually is. Let me explain. In the Bible, when a husband and wife have sexual relations, it is sometimes referred to as knowing. In other words, instead of saying Adam had sex with Eve, it would instead say, Adam knew Eve. 
This is found often in the King James Version, King James Version of the Bible. So sometimes the word know is referring to an intimate relationship. This is what indeed is being referred to by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. By eating the fruit, they are sinning. When they committed their first sin, they intimately knew evil, while also having already known good. Thus, by sinning, you know good and evil. There are two types of knowledge of good and evil. One is knowing about good and evil. All creatures know about good and evil, but the second one, knowing good and evil, is referring to an intimate relationship between good and evil. How do you have this intimate relationship? By doing both good and evil. This is what is condemned, and Adam and Eve clearly knew morality before they ate of the tree. In this video, your analogy is severely flawed. In the case of the person who hit your car, it was an accident. Thus, this accident would in no way be a moral transgression. You make the huge mistake of comparing this to two humans as well. Yahuwah is on a much greater scale than created humans. A human whose car got hit would have the moral obligation to reach out and try and talk to the person that hit his car. Yahuwah does not have this obligation. Why? Because in the case of Yahuwah, if it wasn't a moral transgression, he doesn't care. And Yahuwah knows absolutely whether or not something is a moral transgression, for he knows all our thoughts and each and every one of our intentions. But for the person in your analogy, he has no idea what the thoughts of the person in the accident were, nor his intentions. Thus, for any and all accidents that occur, it would be your duty to seek out the person who hit your car. Now let's discuss the person who hit your car. Consider what the car has. The car has evidence of an owner. For example, the design and make, the color and year it was made in, and even the license plate assigned to it. Now, at the time you hit the car, you have no idea what the license plate is. But you have that car to figure out who this owner is. But in order to figure out who the owner is, you have to inspect the car and look for the license plate number. Then you have to go and report it to the police and they will tell you who the man is that owns the car so you can pay back the person. In life, this is what Yahuwah does. Except in real life, there is nothing morally wrong with crashing into a car. I'm changing the analogy a little bit in order, in order to demonstrate a more correct view of Yahuwah. In my understanding of the corrected analogy, Yahuwah wants you to find something that belongs to him. It's clearly right there, but you have to follow the steps. Yahuwah has given each and everyone their own car to crash into. You crashed into a car, but you walked away. Now, the key here is that the, the cars always remain where they are. So you can always return so long as you are alive in order to figure out who the owner of the car is. What do the cars stand for in this analogy? They stand for light. Everyone is given a certain amount of Yahuwah's light. This light is what man is accountable to. Some people are more accountable than others because they have more knowledge and more responsibility. So even the one that has the least amount of light revealed to him, if he responds to it and follows through, he will find the owner of the car. But he has to follow through with it. Now secondly, there are certain crimes in the Bible that deserve the death penalty. Other crimes do not. Why is there a distinction? Because some sins are worse than others. So for the person who intentionally crashed into your car, they morally sinned. But it would be immoral to give that person the death penalty. Why? Because a car is just a little piece of property. All it is is mere possessions that really mean nothing and have no value in and of themselves. Further, even if it wasn't inherently wrong to burn someone to death for uh, you would not be allowed nor is it your right why is it not your right because only the government is allowed to give the death penalty a good government is fairer in judgment and is not about sadism 
whereas personal vengeance would almost indefinitely result in purely sadistic means of punishing someone who may or may not actually be guilty of the crime. The problem with everyone taking the law into their own hands is that they could do just about anything while claiming that the person deserved it. But how can this ever be known to be true? It has to be established by the government in order for it to be acceptable. Further, the punishment must fit the crime, as the Bible teaches, an eye for an eye. The severity of a punishment must never exceed the severity of the crime. Think about what modern society, society does to murderers. Often they put them in jail for their entire life. That was just one crime committed, but they have to be in jail, or in other words, punished, for the rest of their lives. Assuming you see nothing wrong, inherently wrong with this kind of punishment, why should it be any different for the afterlife? A person who is punished for their crimes and sentenced to life until they were to die, but in the afterlife, no one dies, so they will always be in prison. So long as a person is alive in this life, Yahuwah rightly allows him to repent. He wouldn't be merciful or just if he didn't allow them to repent in this life. But once this life is over, you can no longer repent. Thus, the righteous punishment of Yahuwah can only be poured out on us when Yahuwah delays his punishment for the chance that we repent of our sins. Now, many people ask why people cannot repent after death. The reason is that in the afterlife, repentance means nothing. The reason it means nothing is because it is not actually repentance. It's not true repentance. Why is it not true repentance? Because repentance is not a mere get-out-of-jail-free card. Repentance requires that you must be willing to suffer for Yahuwah. You must be willing to live righteously. The person that is in the afterlife is not willing to suffer for Yahuwah. If there is no willingness to suffer, there is not true repentance. <coughs> a person who feels bad about their sins merely because they don't want to go to hell is not going to be saved, and that is not true repentance. True repentance is that you have to live righteously, and you have to want to live righteously. You have to, you have to desire never to sin again, and you have to never sin again. For the people in the afterlife, they would continue to keep sinning if they were forgiven. Yahuwah demands justice. Justice is a good thing. Justice can be served in one of two ways. Way number one is that a person is punished an eye for an eye and nothing more. Way number two is that a person must repent. When a person repents, they are willing to do anything right. They must now suffer the pains of repentance and the hardship of being righteous in a wicked world. These are the two ways of justice. You basically want Yahuwah to not be just, but what kind of Elohim would Yahuwah be if he was not just? He certainly would not be a morally good and loving being. As the scriptures say, Yahuwah created two lives for the purpose of morality, this life and the afterlife. This life tests you. The afterlife is the score you receive on your test. How can you get the score unless there is an end to the test? If there is no end to the test, there will never be a score. But if there is never a score, then what is the purpose of the test? There is no purpose for the test unless there is an end to the test and evaluation of what you did on that test. Also, not all humans are sinners. You are wrong about this. Just because you sin and your, family's, your family and friends sin every day does not mean everyone sins every day. The truth is, all who continue to sin will not be saved. If I sin, I will be in danger of hell unless I repent. And repentance means stop sinning for the rest of your life. If you do not live holy and righteous, you will go to hell. I don't care if you are a Christian, a Muslim, or whatever. If you do not stop sinning, you deserve hell. It's that simple. Now, I'll explain my views on hell fully in another response video to one of your other videos, but let me just say in this video that Hitler's punishment in hell will not be the same punishment for someone who is an unrepentant thief. There are degrees of punishment in hell. As I said earlier, it is an eye for an eye. The severity of the punishment is based on the severity of the crime. If you maliciously cut off one of my fingers and do not repent of it, you deserve an eternally lasting punishment that is equivalent to the severity of cutting off my finger. If you maliciously cut off my hands and do not repent of it, 
you deserve an eternally lasting punishment that is equivalent to the severity of cutting off my hands. For every sin you commit, you deserve an increasingly greater in severity eternally lasting judgment, punishment. For example, let me, say a, let me say a small analogy. This does not serve to demonstrate the horror of hell, but it does serve to demonstrate the differences of punishment. For one person, because of their sins, they will have a paper cut for eternity. But for the ones that were really, really wicked, they will be in such great torments that it cannot be described. This is the difference. Your eternal punishment is based on how much wickedness you did. So to answer your question, Yahuwah is not powerless to forgive us after death. But if he did forgive us after death, he would not be a just Elohim. How does the Atonement of Messiah work? There are many different theories. I believe the only one that can answer your question adequately is the governmental theory of atonement. How this works is essentially Yahushua's atonement will only apply for his bride. Now, when I say bride, I don't mean he literally married someone. The scriptures often refer to all the true followers of Elohim collectively as the bride of Messiah. So essentially, how it works is Yahushua's atonement is applied to his bride. Whoever wants their sins atoned for must become part of the bride of Yahushua. Anyone who does not belong to the bride of Yahushua will not have their sins forgiven. Now, Yahushua's atonement never offers to pay for the sins of all individual people. It only pays for the sins of his bride. So, sin is not being paid for twice over. You either have to pay for your sin, or Yahushua pays for the sins of, his, of the bride, and only of the bride. And by becoming part of the bride, your sins are forgiven. Now, how does someone become part of the bride? I'll tell you how. They have to repent. Repent means they have to stop sinning. They must forsake all sin and plan and, plan and fully intend with all their being, never to sin again. If they sin again, they were liars and did not have true repentance and are not going to be saved unless, at some point later, they truly repent. Once they fully devote their lives to Yahuwah by true repentance, only then are they saved. You are right that it's up for Yahuwah to accept the atonement of Messiah, but as I said, Yahuwah has made it very clear that Messiah's death only atones for his bride. And you can only be his bride by either never sinning or repenting of your sins and never sinning again. Also, please realize that Yahushua never went to hell. This is a misunderstanding brought about by confusing language being used in the King James Version of the Bible. Also, not 99% of people are going to hell. The Testament of Abraham, a book I believe is scripture, teaches that for every one person that goes to paradise, seven people will be in torments. So I did the math, and that equals 87.5% of people going to hell. But this number is not so bad when you realize that this is only taking into account humans. There are also many animals that won't be in torments, and the majority of angels also will not be in torments. So when you look in the grand scheme of things, it is not as depressing as it seems. It is also possible that the 87.5% is only 87.5% of people who have sinned before. The Testament of Abraham may not be referring to a percentage of all people, but only a percentage of those who have sinned, and as I believe, not all people have sinned. So this further makes the number even better. Anyways, in conclusion, I believe that the governmental view of atonement best answers your important question. I think the fundamental flaw in your argument is the misunderstanding of free will. Free will is not the ability to do anything without any consequences. Truthfully, if all actions had no consequences, there would be no meaning to your actions in the first place. For example, let's say you wanted to murder someone. 
In order to murder someone, it has to be possible for the consequences of murder to take, to take place, namely that the person you want to murder would have to die in order for you to have murdered that person. This is called a consequence. All actions have a consequence. If they didn't have a consequence, then actions would not have meaning. In order for an action to have meaning, there must be consequences. And furthermore, if it is only possible to have good consequences, then good doesn't really exist, for the value of good can only exist when it is possible not to do good. If you could choose not to do good, then your goodness actually means something. If it was impossible not to not choose good, then good really ceases to be good. Further, it is impossible for Yahuwah to have not given his creatures that free will. By very definition, a creature must have free will. If they do not have free will, they are not a creature. Now, remember that the point of free will is so that good can actually exist. But as I mentioned, in order for good to actually be good, there has to be the ability to do evil. So the purpose of free will is not that you can you, is not that you have the ability to choose between good and evil. The person of free will the purpose of free will is that you can choose good. Yahuwah does not want you to choose evil, but he does want you to, to, to choose good. And the only way you can choose good is if you can also choose evil. Thus, the purpose of free will is so that you can choose good. Now, to help fit it into your analogy, the reason Yahuwah gives you money is not so that you can spend it foolishly, but that you can spend it wisely. He does not give you money and say you can't spend it. Rather, he gives you money so you can be able to buy good things. So the purpose for the gift of money is that you can buy good things, but in order to buy good things, you have to be able to buy bad things. And if you buy bad things instead of buying good things, then you will suffer the consequences of owning the bad thing you bought. Also, the definition of sin you mentioned in the video is a flawed definition. Sure, sin is against the will of Yahuwah, but sin is not sin merely because it is against Yahuwah. The classic Euthyphro dilemma addresses this issue very nicely. It asks the following question. Is what is morally good commanded by God because it is morally good, or is it morally good because it is commanded by God? And the answer is, God commands things because it is morally good of him to command it. It is not mere morally good good merely based on the fact that he commanded it. So the answer to your question on what's the point of free will if we aren't allowed to use it is that you are wrong about free will and that we are allowed to use it. The whole purpose of free will is so that you are able to do good. That's the whole reason behind free will. Not so that you can do evil, but in order to be able to do good, you have to be able to do evil. The only reason why you are able to do evil is that you are able to do good. Now for those that don't want to do good, they have the free will not to do good. But since the purpose of free will is that they choose good, there will be consequences for their choosing evil. But aren't these bad consequences what the person who is sinning is asking for? Isn't punishment what they effectively want when they choose to do evil instead of choosing to do good? Thus, free will stands in that you... Your free will allows you to receive what you have chosen for yourself. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say that I am not opposed to all kinds of violence. I believe violence is sometimes necessary and a morally good thing, depending on why it is being done. Now, you say that when watching a movie, many Christians do not want their kids to see the violence. And I'll explain why they are justified with this. You see, there is a very big difference in approving of violence and enjoying violence. You see, sadism is extremely sinful. It is wrong to be entertained by others suffering. When watching movies, often the movie is encouraging the views, the viewers, to be entertained by violence. This is simply wrong. No one should take joy in the violence that is being done. It should be saddened that violence became necessary. Secondly, 
Most violence in movies is not necessary, and it is completely of an immoral kind. The characters employing the violence enjoy the violence and do not distribute violence justly or fairly. They are excessive, cruel, and offer no mercy. With Yahua, this is not true. Yahua's punishments are not excessive. They match perfectly the crime. It is rightfully an eye for an eye. In the movies, it exceeds an eye for an eye, and it is not about justice, generally. It is simply about sadism. Yahuwah's punishments are also not cruel. We have to be careful with the word cruel, because cruel has many different meanings. When I say Yahuwah is not cruel, I mean that the punishment is not anything more than the person deserves, and it is with pity that Yahuwah punishes his creation, not without pity. And further, Yahuwah's punishments are not without mercy, for Yahuwah has given them mercy their entire lives to repent and turn from their wickedness so that they wouldn't have to be punished an eye for an eye. Remember, in the movies, the pain being inflicted is almost always not called for because the person is not being shown proper mercy and the punishment does not fit the crime, for the punishment is sadistic rather than just. Also, as I said in a previous video response to one of your other videos, not everyone's punishments in hell will be the same punishment. There will be a lot of differing kinds of punishments. But essentially, saying all sinners deserve hell is essentially the same as saying all people who break the United States law deserve to be punished by the United States law. Being punished by the United States law can refer to a very wide variety of differing sorts of punishment, each to varying severity. So remember that the severity of the punishment cannot be greater than the severity of the crime. In movies, the severity of the violence being inflicted almost always exceeds the severity of the crime. Also, when people torture others, it's usually torturing innocent people. Thus, it is never justifiable to torture someone who did not do anything wrong. You can't morally torture someone for a crime they didn't even commit. So, many of these things just go to show how flawed your understanding of violence and punishment is. So, to answer your question, since I have sinned in my life before, if I have not repented of my sins, then I deserve to be punished in hell. But as I said, the severity of my punishment in hell would match the severity of the sins that I have committed. If you go to hell, the severity of your punish of your sins are different than the severity of my sins, and thus the severity of your punishment in hell would be greater than the severity of my punishment in hell would be. You are wrong about punishment. You claim that there are only three purposes of punishment. Corrective, deterring, and protecting society. Now, Hell is definitely not corrective, at least when you are in hell, it doesn't correct you, because it's too late. Hell is deterring, but this is not the main purpose of hell. And in heaven, we will be protected from the people in hell, because the people in hell will not be able to hurt us with their sin, for all sin hurts people. Also in hell, people will not be able to hurt each other. But this also is not the main purpose for hell. Now let me get to the good part of this video. There is actually a fourth purpose of punishment that you fail to acknowledge, which is acknowledged by almost all groups of people, so I'm a bit surprised you did not mention it in your video. The fourth purpose of punishment, the one in which I advocate, is called retributive justice, or retributive punishment. Retributive punishment states that all, the only purpose of a punishment is to punish the person because that person deserves that punishment. There is no other purpose for the punishment. It's not so that per that person will behave better. It's strictly punishment given to someone because they deserve that punishment. So to answer your question, the purpose of hell is for the purpose of punishment. There is no other reason for the existence of hell. It is better for people to be in hell than to cease to exist, or to never have existed at all.
Yahuwah did not fail to do anything. The people failed. Yahuwah created all the souls. By very definition, a soul has free will. If a soul has free will, it can't be controlled. So Yahuwah does not fail when we use our free will to rebel against Yahuwah. We fail. Now, our failures do not mean that Yahuwah has failed. On the contrary, he has created the best of all possible worlds, and he has done the best he is able to do with us having free will. Yahuwah has succeeded in everything he intended to do. He intended that souls exist, and knowing what these souls would do, he picked the best scenario where all the souls do the best possible thing. It is in this way that Yahuwah is certainly not a failure. Only sinners are failures. So, in answer to your question, yes, I believe that the scriptures provide a fully accurate account of a perfect being who never failed once and did everything he intended to do. The flaw in what you are saying is that all people have to know that the Messiah died on the cross and was raised from the dead in order to be saved. This couldn't be further from the truth. The scriptures do not teach this. All the books of scripture written before the Messiah was born teach that people are saved. But how could they be saved if they didn't acknowledge the death and resurrection of the Messiah? Thomas's salvation was not based on knowing that Yahushua was resurrected. The only reason Yahushua wanted Thomas to be absolutely convinced it was him who actually was resurrected was that Thomas could boldly preach to the world the goodness of Yahuwah's saving grace through the atonement of Yahushua. Now, I hope to explain this in much greater detail in a future response video to one of your other videos, but I will just briefly touch upon it in this video. Messiah only intervenes when he is asked to intervene, and even then, he will only intervene when it leads to the greatest amount of people not going to hell. Again, the answer to your question is that this evidence that Yahushua was resurrected had nothing to do with Thomas's salvation. It only had to do with other people's salvation, in that Thomas had to be fired up and bold in, in order to be able to preach the truth to the nations and save people's souls. I think the confusion of what the word religion means is creating this dichotomy in your mind. In my understanding, the word religion can mean essentially a person's worldview of life or a person's philosophy on life. Atheism is indeed a philosophical position on life and it is a worldview on life, so in that sense, it is a religion or mainly part of the religion of that person. For Atheism has a wide variety of philosophical positions that are connected to it. There can be many atheists that are much more moral than most other people. And then there are and then there can be many atheists who are the most wicked people you could ever meet. This demonstrates a vast diversity in an atheistic worldview and philosophy. So, is atheism a religion? It can be, though it can also just be part of a religion. However, if you don't like the connotations of that word religion, it can just be said that atheism is simply a philosophy or worldview, and this is true. And in all honesty, it is simply saying the same thing as saying atheism is a religion. I also further agree that the existence of atheists in and of themselves is not evidence for the existence of Elohim. However, interestingly enough, the scriptures do prophesy that atheism will drastically increase in the last days. This has been demonstrated to be occurring, and thus, this is some evidence for Yahuwah. However, taken by itself, it is not convincing evidence. It is not firm proof. Much more proof is rightly to be required to prove Yahuwah's existence.
Many scientific theories originate out of a naturalistic and evolutionary viewpoint, and this viewpoint is usually associated with atheism, though not necessarily. I'd just like to clarify the correct teaching concerning atheists. Atheism in and of itself is a sin. It's a sinful lifestyle. It's a sin to be an atheist. There is no excuse for atheism. All people are fully expected and capable of being able to acknowledge the true Elohim. Thus, if an atheist were to never sin once in any other area of their life, but remained an atheist, they would still go to hell. However, an atheist's punishments in hell would be much less severe than many hypocritical religious people who continue to sin and grossly sin and will go to hell for their sin, and they will be punished much greater than that atheist who otherwise lived a perfect life. Once again, in this video, you make a similar claim to that of your video on Thomas. It is not necessarily the case that Paul would not have been saved had Yahushua not appeared to him. Paul could have repented of his sins later in his life. Now, the only reason that Elohim gave this evidence to Paul was that he was asked to give it. He was asked to intervene. Prayer allows for Yahuwah to prayer allowed for Yahuwah to reveal himself to Paul. If people hadn't prayed, he wouldn't have been able to reveal himself to Paul. Yahuwah also would not reveal himself to people who were firm in their hard-heartedness. Paul was not firm in his hard-heartedness. And as I said in the Thomas video, Yahuwah will sometimes not intervene, even when he is asked to, because if he had intervened, it would have, in the grand scheme of things, led to even more people going to hell. So, to answer the bonus question, Yahushua revealing himself to Paul was not a violation of free will, but it was precisely because of free will that Yahuwah revealed himself to Paul. Your misunderstanding of sin would contribute to why you made this video. You seem not to understand what sin is. Sin is simply the misuse of that which is good. And that which is good, by very nature, is pleasurable. So, why is sin pleasurable? The reason it is pleasurable is because sin is misusing that which is good. Or in other words, it is pleasurable because sin is misusing that which is pleasurable. That is why it's pleasurable. It is illogical to ask Yahuwah to make sin only be something that is not pleasurable. Why is it illogical? Because first of all, Yahuwah doesn't make anything sinful, as I already covered in a previous response video. And secondly, in order for anything to be good, it has to also have the ability to be misused. If it was not able to be misused, then it would not be good. But if it can be misused, then that entails that this misuse would be by nature pleasurable because it is misusing something designed for pleasure or good. In order for sin to never be pleasurable, you would have to make it so that nothing pleasurable exists. But that would be more wicked than making pleasurable things, which would entail also pleasurable sin to come from those pleasurable things. Now, a final thing to say is that sex is good and pleasurable, but it is so intimate and personal that it is only to be shared within the boundaries of marriage. Anything outside of these bounds is misusing the good. Yahuwah made sex so pleasurable precisely so that people could be intimate and personal, personal with someone else who could be intimate and personal with them at the same time. Removing the nerves would be asking Yahuwah to remove something good, and that would be wrong of Yahuwah to do this.
and I bet you would at this point say that animals do not get married, and we don't call this sin. Well, you are wrong about this. Animals do get married, but marriage is simply a mutual lifelong dedication between two complementary creatures, and animals do this. And any animal that has sex outside of marriage is sinning and needs to repent. You may think I am joking about this, but I am not. I am a biblical animus. I believe that all animals have free will and have the ability to sin and do sin. It is scientifically documented that animals display morality in the same kind of way that humans do. Thus, the issue of morality is the same for humans and animals. If morality is sin, then animals sin. It's as simple as that. I hope to make a video in the future that isn't a video response to one of your videos, but just simply one of my own videos on my channel that is simply of my own initiative to explain why biblical animism should be believed by all and what the ramifications of these beliefs entail. I reject most Christians as apostate. It is my firm belief that most Christians will go to hell. Why do I believe this? Because most Christians are hypocrites, and all hypocrites will go to hell. I belong to a religion called Nazarene Judaism. Nazarene Judaism is a resurrected sect that existed back in the first several centuries after Messiah was born. Nazarene Jews were the original Christians. Nazarene Jews believed, and believe today, that Messiah was born of a virgin and that Messiah is Yahuwah. However, we don't stop there. We also believe in what is called total submission to the Law of Moses, otherwise known as the Torah. Thus, the Law of Moses was never abolished. So what kind of things do we do as a Nazarene Jew? Well, everything that, that the Torah tells us to do. We don't work on the Sabbath. We celebrate all the Jewish festivals. We only eat clean foods. We purify ourselves when we have become unclean. We wear a tzitzit, etc. Now, there are certain things we are only required to do when we are able to do. For example, when we are able to, we must return to Israel, but only when we are able to. But when you, and when you aren't in Israel, there are certain things you aren't able to do, and thus are not supposed to do according to the Torah. Further, we are not allowed to stone anyone to death for their sins. Only the Sanhedrin has that authority, and until the Sanhedrin is restored, we don't have to do that. However, we must encourage the restoration of the Sanhedrin. Likewise, the priesthood is also currently not existing, but very soon it will likely be restored. When it is restored, we will be required to sacrifice animals in Jerusalem. Now, to the issue of why animal sacrifices are still to be done. The reason animal sacrifices are to be done now and before Messiah, for the same, there it is the same reason that we do it now as we did before, is that animal sacrifices are completely different than the sacrifice of Messiah. But animal sacrifices have nothing to do with removing our sins. Animal sacrifices do not save anyone. What animal sacrifices do? is that when you are able to sacrifice animals, when the priesthood is restored, you are required to sacrifice the animals. If you do not sacrifice animals, you are rejecting Yahuwah. Animal sacrifice encourages repentance of the community and a proper perspective on the effects of sin. Another reason that animal sacrifices are done is that by sacrificing the animals, we acknowledge that we fully accept the sacrifice of Yahushua. And further, animal sacrifices, animal sacrifices are necessary in order to enter sacred and holy places. Animal sacrifices apply 
still today and give us earthly purity, whereas the sacrifice of Messiah applies and gives us heavenly purity. Thus, on this earth, the animal sacrifices are required for us to be pure. In the afterlife, only Messiah's one-time sacrifice is required for us to be pure. Purity is not limited to just sin, but just to uncleanness in general. In the Torah, we learn that when a woman gives birth, she is unclean for about two months. This does not mean she is sinful or in a sinful state. It just means that she is impure. So animal sacrifices are necessary for earthly purity, but impurity is not necessarily sinful. If we reject animal sacrifices with full knowledge of animal sacrifices, however, we are sinning because this is a direct rebellion against Yahuwah's commands. Now, I ask you, do you believe that eating some animals is not wrong? If you believe it is not wrong to eat some animals, then you should have no problem with animal sacrifices. Why? Because when an animal is sacrificed, it is eaten by the priest. Thus, there really is no difference between the ethics of sacrificing an animal and merely eating an animal, because both are being eaten in the end, and the animal that is being sacrificed is simply being blessed and set apart for Yahuwah. Also, one final note. The prophecies of Ezekiel happened before the end of the world. The chron chronology of the end of the world is as thus follows. First, we have Messiah being born of the Virgin Mary and dying on the cross. That was in the first century AD. Then we have the tribulation, which is a total length of seven years. Then after the seven years, the Messiah returns to the earth in the year 2150 AD and reigns on earth for 1,000 years. This is called the Millennial Kingdom. Then, after the Millennial Kingdom, the earth is destroyed, and a new earth is created, and all the people who are righteous and saved will live on this new earth, otherwise known as heaven. However, the wicked people will at that time, after the Millennial Kingdom, be thrown into the lake of fire, not before the Millennial Kingdom. So, the sacrifice, the Excuse me. So the prophecies of Ezekiel teach that animals are always to be sacrificed on this current earth. The section in Ezekiel is not talking about the new earth, but it is talking about the Millennial Kingdom. Thus, in the Millennial Kingdom, there will be sacrifices because the Millennial Kingdom is before the end of this world. But when the end of the world comes and the new earth is created, the animal sacrifices will no longer be done, and instead, the sacrifice of Messiah will be applied once and for all. Just to clarify, the scriptures do speak of the Millennial Kingdom often as a new earth, but it is speaking of new in the sense that it is the same earth just in a restored condition during the Millennial Kingdom. However, after the Millennial Kingdom, Mother Earth will literally die, and she will be resurrected and given a new body, just like all humans will be given a new body. So, in scripture, there are two new earths. One, the first one, is simply a new change of the old earth. And the second one is a, a new earth that comes after the Millennial Kingdom. And it will be a creation of a new earth, instead of simply a new change of the old earth. I hope I have been able to explain to you sufficiently why animal sacrifices are still commanded now and in the Millennial Kingdom.